Well, good morning. We're glad that you are here. I'm Stephen Gaither. I serve as the lead pastor here. Uh, I want to say uh, that we're a church that believes there is hope and healing in one name, and that name is? Yeah. There you go. Okay. And we uh, seriously believe that we experience that hope and that healing that we continually need from Christ uh, as we abide in Christ. Um, so that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, one day at a time, uh, as we build healthy relationships. And uh, if you've interacted with any other human beings this week, you know that building healthy relationships is not always easy. Um, and that's when I'm just dealing with me. Have a good relationship with just me is a problem. I'm, I, can be, I can have some issues. Uh, but we know that building healthy relationships is such an important part of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And we know that we are abiding in Christ, we're building healthy relationships, and we're a part of a greater community. And we want to care for our community, um, whether we're here, there, or, or anywhere. We want to be focused on that. Part of uh, living in the Rio Grande Valley means that there's some unique cultures here. And uh, so this is a time and a season of celebration in a lot of places um, as high school High schools come to the end of their school year. You've got these graduates. They're finishing up. They're getting ready to launch um, into that next chapter of life. A lot of celebrations happening in the valley. Uh, on Friday, we were able to do graduation. I've never seen so many people on Trenton Road in my entire life. Um, everybody was out of school at the same time and all decided to go to the same places. Um, and so we were able to celebrate and uh, last Sunday, I just want to say thank you uh, for you uh, as a church body um, coming together. Last Sunday was great. I mean, to be able to have small groups together, study the Word, to be in worship uh, with Lucas January, who's our student minister, for him to open up the Word for us as we prayed over our graduates, and then as we just had the time together. Um, it wasn't that long ago um, that we were all forced to be a separated and apart, and we're all still recovering from that, but that is a, a sweet time. That's a big part of what it means to be a church, uh, to be that church family that's encouraging one another. So thank you for your love and your care for our graduates. Thank you especially to our men's ministry, that group that said, hey, we want to help make this happen. Um, I've already lined them up for the next 15 years to do that. So we appreciate you guys uh, on that one. Uh, but just thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here this morning, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at the, the worship team. And I don't know if you noticed or not, but one of our teenagers was on the drums. We've got one of our graduates over there singing next to his dad. Yeah, you can clap that up. Um, you got a ballerina and her mom together, worshiping together. You know, you look at multiple generations. You have all these young people and Butch. Um, <laughs> So I just look at that. Yeah, you can clap them. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. They, they work together, multiple people, some that aren't, weren't able to be here today. But there's just a group of people that they love and they care about that. And they week in and week out communicate and work together and navigate through things. And to be able to see multiple generations um, coming together, worshiping and leading us in worship, that's a special thing. And so uh, that's important. You know, there's, there's men in our church that uh, you might not see them a lot. You might know a lot about what they're doing, but they do a good job of consistently caring for people. Um, and, our, and our deacon body and what they do with our widows and widowers and the fellowship they have with one, another's, with one another and the care that they take. Um, that's an important part of the life of our church. Um, in the life of a church, you know, preachers get a bad rap. And some of us, I mean, it's due because the way ha things get handled from time to time. Um, but people are always nervous about church and money. Um, and I'm so thankful for uh, our finance committee. We've got a great group of people with good checks and balances that are looking over everything. Mary Kelly, she serves our finance manager and stewards that well. Just really thankful for the people. Yeah, you can clap that up. It's the, the reality of, of what we're trying to do as a church and the mission we're on, the funding of that is incredibly important along the way. It's not the most important thing, but it's an indicator, and, and we're in a healthy spot as how we manage that, and that's because there's a group of people involved in that. I think about our church staff, um, and we've got, a, we've got a great group of staff, and uh, we call her Mama Moni, uh, Monica Rosita. She's been here. She's probably the longest one that's been here. And we hired a bunch of young guys uh, in there, so she's Mama Moni, 
many days. If you come into the office, you're going to hear her say, Andrew, Brian, does she ever yell at you, Lucas? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's a mama's boy, so he works out just fine over there. Um, but, I, but I'm watching what's taking place even uh, with a lot of things that y'all don't get to see, but, I, but I'm watching the, the interaction, the relationships. You know, Josh Grantham, my goodness, his, his life and this campus is wild. <laughs> Crawl spaces and light bulbs and things that you just don't even want to know about. Um, and squeegee mopping, uh, air conditioner leak even this morning, um, the things that, that he's doing. What, I, what I'm seeing, though, is even within our staff and staff families is unity in a community. You can't have community without unity, and that's an important piece of it. And to, to know, I call them the young guns, um, and I know in this church I can still say the word gun, and it's okay. Uh, but our young guns with, with Lucas and Andrew and Titus that we as a church license to the ministry at the end of the year. Titus will be here uh, preaching next Sunday. I see what God's doing there. Um, I think about our small groups. Um, you know, you can call them Sunday school, small groups, whatever you want to call them. The most important thing is that it's a group of people consistently gathering together for community under the Word of God. And, uh, you know, I, I sit in or pop in every once in a while, and every one of our groups is very diverse. There's all kinds of different life phases happening in there, uh, and that's a good thing. But to where a group of people where you consistently go to, where things need to get smaller so people know you and you're sharing those opportunities. There's things that small groups know about that are happening in the lives of people that I, that I never know about, and that's okay. That's part of the body working together and caring for one another. It should happen. And that's a good thing. I'm so thankful for the multiple people who teach and study and work through that and care for those groups of people. And so I just want to say from, from your pastor's heart, I'm just so thankful for those of you that are here hearing my words and those that aren't here today. Just really grateful for that. Um, there's, a, there's a group of people week in and week out that work with our kids in our pre-K. We've got so many volunteers. That's, I don't know if you've been around a kid lately. There's, there's a lot of stuff happening with student ministry, with kids ministry, pre-K. I'll tell you that the people that are working in those areas, man, they are caring for those kids. They want to make sure that they're in a safe environment, that we're protecting them, that we're teaching them and discipling them. And what's happening in there is huge. Every Wednesday for midweek with our women's group, our men's group, um, there's, there's all these opportunities that are taking place. I'm th so thankful for the people who invest week in and week out investing that time to prep and to teach and to have that relationship with people. Uh, and then just the overarching what's happening in the life of the church. Um, I'm just really grateful for where we are as a church and the steps that we're taking and the partnerships that God continues to provide. The reason I'm even introing it in that way is because this morning as we're in this Multiply series, we come to a spot where we're going to look at some passages that describe the early church. You know, so in this time frame where, where Jesus has done his public ministry, he's been crucified, he's been buried, and then he comes back, he's raised again, and he spends 40 days with different pockets of people, and then he ascends into heaven. He gives us the Great Commission, and then those people are told to go back to Jerusalem and wait because the Holy Spirit is going to come in a new and unique way and fall on the people. And then become an indwelling spirit in the lives of every believer. And so when this begins to take place in the book of Acts, you just, you just have to know like what they thought was happening and what we think has to happen for it to be church. These are very different things. If we begin to start saying, like, what's a church? We're going to talk about a building. We're going to talk about pews. We're going to talk about music. We're going to talk about somebody preaching. We're going to talk about small groups or Bible studies. We're going to talk about, well, we should do some sort of fellowships. Like, we should do this. We should give them. And we're going to start making a really complex list of things. And all of those are important ingredients in a recipe. But we can never miss the main thing. And the main thing is always about Jesus and the community of believers that gather together to faithfully follow after him and do what he said. It's ultimately when everything else gets broken down, we're going to look at that. So the church, what is the church? And a lot of people will tell you a lot of things. But ultimately the church is the people of God who have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ and are learning to follow him. So individuals that have received the forgiveness of their sins in Christ... 
through that substitutionary atonement that He took our place on the cross and paid the penalty for our sin, that we know and we understand that Jesus Christ shed His own blood so that we might have forgiveness. This morning in small group, you know, the idea of the promise to be fruitful and that that what we see happens in Genesis chapter 3, which is a real bummer. In Genesis chapter 3, what happens when sin enters in, it's so destructive and rips us from that relationship with God. But Jesus came to put those things back together. And so in the early church, and we'll look at a variety of passages this morning, but the early church witnessed to the gospel. I mean, they understood. They, they still knew what Jesus looked like. They remembered what his voice sounded like. They would even know that sense of when Jesus was in the room, physically. And as this group begins to multiply and get further and further away from those moments with Jesus, you'll see that they understood what it meant to be the church. And the Holy Spirit's the one that's providing life transformation and the power that they need. So let me give you a list here, and we'll look at some passages. But the first thing is that the early church was a generous community. They were a generous community. Now, when you think about this, I want you to think about generous with their time, generous with their talents, and generous with their treasure. So it, they're generous with their self, they're generous with their skills, and they're generous with their stuff. Generous in these ways. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47, listen to it. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. There's this sense that they were generous with their time. I don't know about you, but man, time, when I was a kid, especially in the summer, like a day lasted forever. And a church service as a kid lasted forever. And now as I'm getting a little bit older, I'm just realizing like we're just kind of going from one little turbo moment to the next. Like in our house... If, I'm telling you, it feels like every other week we have some sort of monumental moment in the life of our family. It's like, wow, that's, somebody will say, oh, that's so, all this was going on in your family. I was like, we call it Tuesday. You know, that's Tuesday. But to be able to pause and to take in those moments about that idea of time. I've got a little coffee cup that has the first three of our kids when they're little bitty. You know, Emma's just this little bitty one. And I've got pictures of them, and I'm sitting there and drinking my coffee and looking up and seeing them eating all of my food. And I'm just like, when did this happen? Time. And how it moves. But there is something about being able to carve out that time to be with people. And at this point, in this time, this is a really unique time in history, okay? The, the church only began one time. This is a unique moment. So we have to be careful not to look at passages like this and go like, well, we have to replicate this exactly. We're going to do church every day. We're all eating together every single meal. Listen, unity would disappear so fast. That's too much. Sometimes you need a break from people. But the idea is is that we look at some of these pieces and you go like, man, there is something early on in the church that there's a generous people with their time, with their resources. And what they're seeing is they surrender themselves, as they surrender their skills, as they surrender their stuff, they're watching God do a unique work. And that's such an important reminder for us. But sometimes it's the time and the energy to be generous with. And sometimes in order for you to be what you need to be for your family, you have to tell other people no. And sometimes for you to be able to be who you need to be in Christ, you have to tell other people no. And there are seasons of life where this season gets a yes here. And in the next season, that'll get a no and something else will get a yes. But this idea of being a generous community. 
things we can ask ourselves, like, hey, when I look in my own life, when I think about how I'm living, when I think about how I'm using my time, talent, and treasure, like, is that in me? Am I, am I generous with my time? Am I generous with my resources? Am I generous with what I'm good at, what the Lord has gifted me in? Am I sharing that, or have I pulled back? The second thing is, they're a holy community. Listen, the rest of the New Testament, all the letters that get written, is towards this same community. So when you hear holy, when you think about God, you're going to think about perfection. He's perfect. He's without sin. He's unable to make the wrong decision. That God is holy. He's set apart. When you think about us, even this early church, you're not thinking about people who are in practical ways perfect, but in people that in Christ are made perfect, that are also set apart, that this is a unique community. So when you see a holy community, I don't want you to think about these first disciples walking around in perfection, in a practical sense. Read the letters that get written to these churches. There's always correction. They're like, Paul's like, listen, I persecuted Jesus. I was against him with everything that I had. But when I met him, my life changed. And you people, oh, you people, (sighs) you're supposed to be set apart. And you're set up for transformation. But I tell you what, y'all know that phrase, you can't fix stupid? You ever heard that one? I'm not labeling that on anybody. But have you heard that one? Like some people say, well, well. You can't fix stupid. Well, maybe. You can help it along a little bit. But in this, like, we're, we're sinners. We know that we're drawn away so often. And what we need is to be set apart, that Christ is continually working on us, that other believers are continually helping us. Because as some would say, humans are going to human. We're going to be prone to those things. But that to be a set apart community means coming alongside one another. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, God has gifted you, and you have some strengths that are growth areas for other people. Some of you are very careful with your words. Others of us, we're more a little more free with the words, and sometimes our words have unintentional consequences. But we need the person who understands, be careful with your words, to be in relationship with the person who's not yet developed that restraint. Some of us are so gifted in service, you wake up thinking about how you can serve other people. It's on your mind. And you're going to find practical ways to serve. And the person who's not yet developed that or is not yet thinking about how they can serve others needs to be in friendship and relationship with that person who's got a strength there. And so you can go down all kinds of characteristics that show up in the life of a church and the community of believers. And what you're going to see is we're all little puzzle pieces and we need to be connected to other pieces. Now, we might not be directly connected from one corner to Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 50. So those who accepted his message were baptized. So they hear the gospel and they respond. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. Have you ever had a friend group where there's like three of you? And y'all finish each other's sentences? Like you, you're, you have very similar vision and values. And you're like, oh, we know how to do this friend thing. And then God adds in one more person. And then you have to figure out, well, now do we do? Now what do we do? Everything is off a little bit. The balance is off a little bit. There's a new perspective, new ideas, new vision. If you've ever been in a job where someone else gets hired and they come alongside you, if you've ever been a part of a sports team uh, and another player gets added in, like all of these things. Now imagine that 3,000 people get added to a group of about 120. Woo! Woo! You're talking about a group of people that was a generous community and they finished each other's sentences and they knew and they'd walked with Jesus. And then they're being obedient and they preach and then 3,000 people get added to the group. Do you think that community of 120 believers had to navigate some change? 
So is change bad? No, change is change. It can be good change, it can be bad change, but this is gospel change that's happening, and then the dynamic shifts immediately. They didn't have pews, so nobody of those 3,000 sat in their seat. You're in my pew. They didn't have that moment, but there's probably somewhere where they were sitting or like, oh man, I used to get to sit close to Peter. You never know what he's going to say at a meal. Everything begins to shift and that dynamic changes. But listen to what it says that they did in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They give you a breakdown of what they were spending their time doing. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. That got a lot bigger. If you ever passed the polga, the flea markets, just imagine like, what is that? Well, that's, those are the Jesus followers. What are they doing? They're sharing their stuff. Like, can you get a good deal over there? Oh, yeah. It's all free. Picture this. I mean, this is a huge group of people. Verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. Dynamic shift from house to house. Now, do you think 3,120 people showed up in somebody's house? Oof. You think it's a lot whenever you've got friends and family coming over. Those cobwebs that have been fine for the last nine months all of a sudden need to be dealt with. This is not how this happened. This begins, they begin to break off. They're a part of this one giant community, but they have to adjust their strategy of how they're going to do this. It's important, but there's this holy and set-apart community, so they're continuing to go after the things that matter most. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, which means they had guacamole. 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people, and every day the Lord added to those that were a part of them. Then you have in Acts chapter 6, look what, look what happens. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, more people, more opportunities, more people, more problems. We have a saying with staff that we can solve this problem, and it is going to create a new problem. I don't know if you figured that one out yet. We are going to solve this problem. We are going to have a beautiful backyard, so we are going to water the grass. We solved the problem, and we created a water bill like that that has never been seen amongst mankind. We solved the problem, and we created a problem. So the people are increasing. The number of people, this is what's happening. All of this is increasing, but all of a sudden now there's a problem that begins to take place. So there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. So now you've got different groups from different perspectives and experiences, and they're saying like, hey, we're not being treated fairly, and we need to deal with that. And so they formed a committee. Just kidding. They didn't do that. But look what ends up happening. There's there's a problem. So verse 2, the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole company, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor. Man, my brain just stopped on how to figure out how to even pronounce that one. Uh, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. Verse 6, they had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread... The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So this group is set apart, it's holy, they're trying to do the right things, 
And the group expands rapidly. Then they realize there's some things that aren't being taken care of. So the leadership says, hey, let's look for spiritual godly men. Let's call them out. And these seven were chosen. They prayed over and said, like, you go solve that problem. You go help with these, uh, these different issues that come up. And then what do you see? Then you see that some priests even come to begin to follow Jesus Christ. When a group of people is organized, solves problems, works in unity, even people who are outsiders will go like, what is, how did you do that? I would like to be a part of this. And so that even in the midst of that unity and solving that issue and that problem, you see that God uses it as a gospel witness to even bring others in to the faith. Next thing is this in verse, th- in chapter, in verse 3, point 3, a fearless community. If I told you right now that I want you to go outside, I want you to find somebody walking on the sidewalk, and I want you to share your faith with them, some of you are like, finally, let's go. You're like, you'll just get up and you'll go. And then there's the rest of us that will go, (gasps) and fear will hit in some way. But this call to be a fearless community, there's lots in the Bible about fear, And when we feel the fear, how we are to take it to the Father and trust Him. So I want to share from you. So we just read about Stephen, who is one of the seven that people said, hey, this guy is full of the Spirit. We see him. We've watched his life. We're telling you we can trust him and put him in some leadership role. And so he's one of the ones that gets called out. And then we're going to see what happens next for Stephen. So... Just because you're trying to be faithful to Jesus, walk after Jesus, it does not mean that your path and what God has for you is safety and security for the, for the rest of your life until you're 95 years old. Sometimes faithfulness and following Jesus is the most dangerous thing for you in this temporary life. And it's the most purpose, purposeful thing in the kingdom Now, this is a lot. There's a lot of things that are being said right here, but I'm going to read it to you because the context of it. So Stephen gets seen as someone who's serving, but he's full of the Spirit, and then he kind of finds himself in a situation where people are questioning him. And I'm telling you, this guy, he summarizes in an incredible way what's happening in the Old Testament, what's happening with Jesus, and then he lays it before these people who are coming after him. And so just think about the boldness of this guy. Verse 1, I'm reading a ton, so just just roll with me. Are these things true, the high priest asked. So the high priest has Stephen there. And then Stephen says this, Brothers and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. And said to him, leave your country and relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this land in which you are now living. They're in Jerusalem in this moment. He didn't give him an inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. But he promised to give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him even though he was childless. God spoke this way. His descendants would be strangers in a foreign land, and they would enslave and oppress them for 400 years. I will judge the nation that they will serve as slaves, God said. After this, they will come out and worship me in this place. And so he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. After this, he fathered Isaac. And circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac became the father of Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his troubles. He gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him ruler over Egypt and over his whole household. Now... A famine and great suffering came over all of Egypt and Canaan, and our ancestors could find no food. When Jacob heard there was grain in Egypt, he sent our ancestors there the first time. The second time, 
Joseph, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Joseph invited his father Jacob and all his relatives, 75 people in all, and Jacob went down to Egypt. He and our ancestors died there, were carried back to Shechem, and were placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought for the sum of silver from, his, from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. As the time was approaching to fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham, the people flourished and multiplied in Egypt until a different king who did not know Joseph ruled over Egypt. He dealt deceitfully with our race and oppressed our ancestors by making them abandon their infants outside so they wouldn't survive. At this time, Moses was born. He was beautiful in God's sight. He was cared for in his father's home for three months. When he was put outside, Pharaoh's daughter adopted and raised him as her own son. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in his speech and actions. When he was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. And when he saw one of them being mistreated, he came to his rescue and avenged the oppressed man by striking down the Egyptian. He assumed his people would understand that God would give them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. The next day he showed up while they were fighting and tried to reconcile them peacefully, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why are you mistreating each other? But the one who was mistreating his neighbor pushed Moses aside, saying, Who appointed you? Would ruler and a judge over us. Do you want to kill me the same way you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And when he heard this, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of the burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. As he was approaching to look at it, the voice of the Lord came. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Moses began to tremble and did not dare to look. The Lord said to him, take off your sandals from your feet, because the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groanings and have come down to set them free. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, who they rejected when they said, Who appointed you a ruler and a judge? This one God sent as a ruler and a deliverer through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out and performed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt at the Red Sea, in the wilderness, for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and sisters. He is the one who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our ancestors. He received living oracles to give to us. Our ancestors were unwilling to obey. Instead, they pushed him aside and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. They even made a calf in those days, offered sacrifice to the idol, and were celebrating what their hands had made. God turned away and gave them up to the worship, the stars of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, House of Israel, do you, rem- do you bring me offerings and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness? You took up the tent of Moloch and a star of your god Raphan, the images that you made to worship. So I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the temple of the testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, received it, and with Joshua brought it in when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before them until the days of David. 
Now, David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. It was Solomon, rather, who built him a house. But the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what will be my resting place? Do not my, do not make uh, my hand make all these, did not my hand make all these things? Listen to this. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did, you do also. Which of the prophets did, our, did your ancestors not persecute? They even killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of the angels and yet not ha- have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Woo! So Stephen becomes a follower of Jesus in this culture with the religious or fighting over power and rules and how do they control people? How do they control access to God? You got the Romans who are the military power over them. Stephen comes to know Jesus. The fellowship of believers has seen that he's generous and that he's holy and he's set apart and given him some roles and responsibilities. And then others find out about him. The high priest challenges him. Like I know some people feel like they're being fearless because they're posting stuff on social media. That ain't Stephen. What Stephen does is they're like, you're causing problems. And Stephen goes, let me tell you a story. And Stephen in this moment with no script except the history that he's learned and he's studied and he's understood as his people and his ancestry, he just goes on. And he begins at the beginning, and he says, let me tell you a little story about where we come from and who you are and who I am, and progresses all the way through it. And then right there at the end, all of a sudden, he turns to them, and he goes, you're just like all the others before. And you know what? All the prophets were persecuted before by people with the same kind of heart like you have. But this time, God didn't just send a prophet. He sent the prophet, the priest, and the king of Jesus Christ, his one and only son. And you know what you people did? You murdered him. But in your evil act, you helped fulfill part of God's redemptive plan because in God's sovereignty, he can use the wickedness of man. And Stephen says, and I'm telling you this right now, you are on the wrong side of God's wrath. Jesus absorbed it for you, but you're not covered yet. You've not come under the atonement, and you're the target, and you better listen up. Woo! Like he just got him. What a moment, this fearless moment. But what we need to keep in mind is that it enraged the people and they gnashed their teeth. And then look what happens in verse 55. So important. Verse 55, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he's not full of himself. He's not full of the moment. He's not trying to platform or to upstage anybody. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And look what it says, he gazed into heaven, he saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. If you know, and what we're about to read, you know what's about to happen, but man, he proclaims it fearlessly. And then God says, let me part this, I'm going to give you a glimpse, and I can't, it doesn't say it in the text, so I have to be careful here, this is not the text. But when I think of this moment, like I know what it's been like to be a, have like proud dad moments and like from a distance and what that feels like for me, I can see in my mind, I see as this is part of, he sees the glory of God and Jesus is standing there at the right hand of God. Like there's just part of me that sees Jesus with a tear in his eye, a smirk on his face and doing the slow clap like, mm. like that was, he did good. Like Holy Spirit, man, you do have a hold of this guy. And God gives him a a taste of peace and the goodness of God and a foretaste of what's to come before he has to endure 
the bitterness of what's about to happen to him. Verse 56, he said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed against him. The juxtaposition of these two moments. God in heaven, peace, the Son, the Spirit working in Stephen, him proclaiming the truth, and the people then in that crazy, wicked, rushing towards them. Peace in the glory of God and the chaos of man. And right in the middle of it stands a man full of the Holy Spirit. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears. Together they rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witness laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. My, 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 what an interesting puzzle piece to connect in this moment. The same Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God that Stephen glimpsed up to could see Stephen and then he could see the garments laid at the feet of Saul who was persecuting the church and he's like next yeah even in the midst of that moment. And then Jesus does show up to Saul of Tarsus later. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it wasn't just Stephen that he saw in that moment. It was a bigger picture. So you got a man full of the Holy Spirit, seeing the glory of God and the wrath of man. You got a man full of his evil spirit, embracing the glory of the wrath of man and celebrating it. And yet Jesus the Savior is saying like, you don't know yet, but I'm about to flip your life upside down. See you in a few weeks. <laughs> uh-huh. That's good stuff right there. So then they drag him out. Saul's there, verse 59 and 60. While they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. What a moment. I mean, he just blew the doors off. They rage against him. He sees the glory of God. Saul's over there overseeing it all. And he says, don't hold this sin against them. You don't think that, that sentence or statement was playing through their minds that night? Even Saul? What do you mean don't hold this sin against us? And then, if it, we don't have time, but in Acts chapter 8, you see this. Um, I'll read this one, then we'll be done. Um, Saul agreed with putting him to death. On that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them into prison. Their potluck and fellowship that was a generous community and a set-apart community all of a sudden had to become a fearless community because everything that they knew and what they knew as church got, got blown up and they got scattered. And it actually fulfills God's will Because he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you won't get out of the pew, I'll remove the pew from you, and you're going to go do it. He's still moving in this. The last thing is a multiplying community. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, to be disciples who make disciples. This is the call. This is the call. This is the process. This is the purpose that we're here for. And the last thing is, is, is that the, the local church has to be a remembering community. A generous community, a holy community set apart, a fearless community, a multiplying community. It's not just about us. We have to be thinking about who's next. Who's next? Who's the next ones that are we going to reach? How are we sharing the gospel with our littles, the youngest ones we have? Because as time goes, they'll be graduating high school. And it's moment by moment, 
leading them in the right direction towards Christ. So we've got to be a remembering community. 1 Corinthians, letter to the church in Corinth. Paul tells them, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. We don't have to make up new stuff. We learn it, we contain it, we share it. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. So as you take your Lord's Supper elements, this is a reminder of remembering what Christ has done for us. And the scriptures say that we're to examine our own hearts. And I think that's part of even as we've read these scriptures and thought about the early church, there early in the book of Acts, it's this idea of, does my heart align with what the early church is hard aligned with. There are so many things to get worked up about. There's so many things to focus on. But we want to be the people that can say, in the midst of a ravaging storm, when people are coming against even what we believe, that we can be people who are full of the Spirit, that we can be connected in relationship with Jesus Christ, that we can have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And that we can be a people in the way that we live and that we speak and how we help others. That even when things are happening in culture that we disagree with, we can say, that's not right. That shouldn't be happening. But let's make sure we maintain Christ-like character in who we are. And that starts in our heart. It's in our heart. And so perhaps you just need to take a moment and say, all right, Lord, is there anything in my life right now that's distracting me from what matters most? And remembering what Christ has done for us. So Jesus took the bread, and as we even hold it today, 2,000 years later, we remember that Jesus Christ came and he lived in the flesh and that his body was broken for us. The passage goes on to say, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper and he said, this cup of the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We want to remember that Jesus Christ really lived. His physical body was here. He was in the flesh. He suffered and he gave his life. That he was willing to lay his own life down for us to pay that penalty of sin so that we might have life and forgiveness And so we remember Jesus' shedding of his blood on the cross to pay the penalty of sin. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we just confess. Our hearts can get so distracted and off course. And it seems like every new week gives us new opportunities to either Rage against the things that are wrong, to be distracted by the brokenness, or to dedicate ourselves to following after Jesus Christ and living out what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we know that you are right and you are good and you are just and you care about things that are right, good, and just. So we just ask that in our own hearts, you would focus on the Focus us on the things that matter most. That we would grow as disciples. That we would help others grow as disciples. That we would do what we can to help the people around us. And that collectively, our efforts of being faithful in the ordinary, Lord, you can put a puzzle together that paints an extraordinary picture that we can't see, we can't do it on our own. But stir in us, Lord, to be a generous community. To be a holy community set apart, to where we have fear to give us courage. Lord, where we might be stagnant, that you would help us to multiply. But Lord, that we would always be a remembering community of what matters most. For the burdens and the issues that we all carry, we pray that we'd be able to use this time in the next few minutes to come to the altar, to lay that aside to lay it at your feet or maybe just to come and have someone pray over us. Uh, 
and that you would find us obedient in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and have a time of response. You might just need to come and pray. Um, Andrew, Lucas, myself will be here. If you'd like for one of us to pray over you, we are certainly willing to do that.